Dad, dad. That is how my daughter says hello to me. Sometimes I think she's saying data, and I become proud and hopeful that she will become an engineer. In this video, we will discuss chip manufacturer data sheets and note implications for logic circuit performance. There are many, many integrated circuits available for purchase. These are also called ICs or chips. I list just four of them here to provide a sense of the descriptions and the product numbers. Also, if you download the slides, you can open these links to access the full data sheets. I'm careful to not include that information directly in the slides because of copyright, although I'm sure the manufacturers would like you to see their product. A description like quad two input NAND gate informs us that the logic gate used is a two input NAND. The word quad means that there are four distinct gates on one chip. This is possible because there are 14 pins on the chip and each gate only requires three pins. Many ICs do contain logic gates, but many others contain combinational circuits. The examples shown here are a 4-bit magnitude comparator and a 4-bit full adder. Not all of these chips hold 14 pins, depending on the number of inputs and outputs required for the particular function. Further, we know that combinational circuits can be designed with subtle nuances, such as whether an adder has a carry-in bit or whether a multiplexer has an enable port. This is one of the big reasons to read data sheets carefully. We need to know exactly what function is being performed by an IC. The product numbers look overwhelming at first, especially since they are printed so small on the chips. I've split apart the number for the SN74HC08N AND chip to examine its components. Note that in each of these boxes, I only provide two examples of what the codes mean. Most of these components have several possible codes, which you could look up. The first two letters tell us the manufacturer. Texas Instruments is the big player here, but there are other companies like Toshiba. The next two numbers indicate the quality or grade of the IC. We use 74, or commercial grade, in class because the environmental conditions are moderate. A 54, or military grade, chip uses higher quality materials that can withstand temperature extremes. The next two letters indicate the underlying technology. Two common types are HC for high-speed CMOS chips and LS for TTL low power chips. The next code, which is usually two or three numbers, is the portion that you probably care most about in our labs. It identifies the function of the chip. For example, 08 is for two input AND gates. 283 is for a four bit adder. The final letter in the product number identifies the physical package. In our labs, we use only plastic dual inline packages, the shape you see in this photo up top. But other packages may be made from different materials, have a different shape, or a smaller size for use in tight spaces. Some of the abbreviations in this number seem arbitrary. For example, why does 74 mean commercial grade? But overall, this is a useful naming scheme. Relatively few letters are used to convey a lot of information, as long as you take the time to look up what they mean. And more importantly, the conventions are used across different companies. So you know that if you see an 08 chip, that it represents AND logic whether it is from Texas Instruments or Toshiba. Data sheets contain all the information you need to know about an IC. Although there is some variation, the sections usually contained are listed here. They start with a broad overview of features, then get more and more detailed as they go. They outline the function being performed with pin diagrams defining inputs and outputs. They provide internal schematics of the actual electrical wiring performing the logic. Then they move into performance characteristics, including maximum voltage and temperature ranges, current and voltage at logic low and high, and propagation delays. 
Finally, they provide the physical dimensions of the chip package and ordering information. There's not much value in memorizing this list. There is value in having a general sense of what information is contained in a datasheet and the diligence to read one when necessary. There are a couple of characteristics from the datasheets that we will focus on. The first is the ranges of voltages that dictate logic values. For the 5 volt TTL chips we use in lab, an input voltage less than 0.8 is interpreted as logic 0. An input voltage between 2 and 5.5 is interpreted as logic 1. Why ranges of values? Why don't we just say that exactly 5 volts is logic 1? Because this is the real world. There is variability in components. There are fluctuations in power supply. There are capacitance and fan out effects depending on how many chips and wires are connected. All of this means that we will never reach exactly 5 volts. We might get close, but never exactly on. So if an input signal comes in at 3.7 volts, that's fine. The ICs will read this as a value of logic 1, or true, or high. There is a buffer zone in between the certain high and low levels. In a properly operating circuit, an input signal should never be at, say, 1.4 volts. If that does occur, it will be interpreted as something, either 0 or 1, but we can't predict what that logic value will be. The output voltages from the chips have a slightly stricter range. A low value will be less than 0.5 volts. A high value will be more than 2.7 volts. This stricter range is necessary because the output from one chip is often used as the input to another chip. Let's say that the output high signal was right around 2 volts. This voltage may be reduced as it passes through a wire and so fall into the uncertain range as the next input. To limit this possibility, the chips are designed to output higher than that 2 volt threshold. A key idea to take away from this is that it will take some time for signals to change. Let's say a NOT gate is currently outputting low. Then the input changes, so it needs to jump high. This does not happen instantaneously. The transistors inside the chip need time to charge in order to allow the electrons to pass. And enough electrons need to pass to build up the voltage to a high level. This leads to the next data sheet information, listed under switching characteristics. Another name for this is propagation delay through a chip, or how long does it take to get the correct output? This table compares the propagation delays through some common logic chips. First, note that these are very small numbers on the order of 10 nanoseconds or 10 billionths of a second. Second, note that delays are usually different, but not very different, when switching from low to high versus high to low. I just show one number for the sake of simplicity. Third, note that these are approximations. Datasheets provide a typical delay and a maximum delay. Why not just one fixed number? Because there is variability in the parts. If they only say that a NAND gate requires 10 nanoseconds, then you might have some design issues when you get the bad apple that requires 15 nanoseconds. There is also variability in the environmental conditions in which they are used. The data in this table assumes these conditions. Ambient temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Driving voltage is 5 volts. Load resistance is 2 kilo ohms. And load capacitance is 15 picofarads. These changes will have the effect of decreasing propagation delay. Increased temperature, increased voltage, decreased load resistance, and decreased capacitance. So. Please do not make the mistake of believing that every number you see published as the absolute truth. Understand that these numbers are variable, dependent on a number of conditions. In the upcoming lessons, we will see how we can apply these delays through individual gates to estimate the total propagation delay through a logic circuit.